All right, so it's great to have you back in the garden, Matt. We got some bugs and some mold to look at, so yeah, let's check it out. There's one over here. Um, you know, I've been spraying with BT and I've seen some little ones, but you know, for instance, so something like this, you can see a bit of damage up here. This, I would have cut this sooner, but I know you guys were coming, so I um, figured I'd leave them so we can uh, show other people how to spot signs of this. And let's crack this open. Oh man, we have some secondary mold. What do you know? What a shame. Yeah, well, you had a good example here uh, before, but uh, if you can find one where one of the leaves... <laughs> yeah, it's on the... So I already cut the top of this one off, but... Um, yes, this is a great one. Yeah, so when you look in here, you can kind of see some of these darkened leaves. And so when you crack this bud open, um, I, I guess, what would that be? It's probably Botrytis, which Something is... Something like that. One of the various bud rot pathogens. Yeah, let's clip that whole sucker off. So most of these plants were untopped, so you get these kind of larger top buds. But, you know, outside that can kind of work against you, especially when you have high humidity and uh, working on getting better air movement. So yeah, it's a shame. One interesting thing about these bud rot pathogens is that there's a bunch of them. A lot of them have very similar symptoms, but you can't really tell the difference a lot of times in the field. And they can even grow in the plant sort of systemically without any symptoms. There's research that shows that, um, at least in the populations that they looked at, the chunkier the bud, basically the more likely you were to have bud rot incidents. Mm. Um, so there is definitely, seems to be some sort of correlation. How far that goes, I'm not sure. How much that's cultivar dependent will probably also matter a lot. Yeah, because like... I've seen I've seen some grows out in the desert where you know they have to add humidity to the air, but here you know with these screened walls and stuff, I'm just kind of at the the mercy of the environment. Uh, all I can do is really move air through here. So you know we've been I've been spraying with this regalia, this um, cannabis grade fungicide. We've done the wettable sulfur earlier in the grow when you know we don't have flowers on the plants. So yeah, it's uh, I guess. They're almost ready to harvest, so you know I'm gonna take out what I can and then probably take this stuff down sooner than later. Mesh screens, in general, they do keep some of the humidity in because mm. they're kind of like a like a fake wall or like a 50% wall, depending on how much mesh screen that you have versus how much um, you know how how small or large the aperture is. So the more you know screen you have, essentially, the more the air has to get buffeted. And so when it comes right. in, it's slower. When it when it leaves, it's kind of slower too. So there can be a downside with that. But well, you talked about that um, that thrip mesh too, where mm -hmm. it has just a, a little bit of a twist, so they can't squeeze their way through. So, you know, I imagine this isn't going to keep any thrips out. But I I do have a couple of little tears. I right, you got some bugs on you, huh? Got some biting <laughs> flies. Oh geez. Yeah. Yeah, you never know what's going to be down here. Uh, but yeah, I do have a couple larger tears. With these raised beds, you know, I transferred all the soil from outside. So I have all this, these little amaranth starts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, uh, well, I don't know if it's going to benefit anything, but it looks like I do have some grasshopper damage. So it's, at least it's eaten these things instead of my, my uh, cannabis plants. So I've been looking for this grasshopper all over. And uh, yeah, you can see him munching on all these leaves. So these look uh, like... A macro pest, right? Something, yes. something big and hungry. So we were walking down here, and I've I've been looking for this thing all week. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, this one is rather large here. I mean, that's uh, probably what like a two and a half inch grasshopper there. Yeah. Found the culprit finally. Yeah, it's pretty big. It looks like maybe a short horned grasshopper, something in that group. But um, there's a lot of them here in California generally and across the U.S. Yeah, I, I usually see them, uh, you know, when they're really tiny, they're little green ones that'll get on the plant, but I don't see them that big often. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they start so small, and they come out of the soil, and then mm. they can travel great distances like most people know, and they'll eat all kinds of plants out there. So they're a big generalist. You know, you're not a bad gardener or a bad grower if you get these guys coming in. They can pretty much eat anything. Yeah, those things are strong too. You know, they, uh, you, you got to uh, sneak up on them to catch them. Yeah, yeah. So one of the other things, um, I, I don't know if I've had an outdoor season where I haven't had to deal with these thrips. And so, 
you can see some of the damage. You can even see them flying around on some of these plants. So, um, you know, I we talked about on our podcast about some of the things that I'd use to treat it, like the spinosad and, uh, you know, that wettable sulfur and things. But, you know, late into flower, it's, you're kind of limited on what you can spray on your plant. But uh, is it a huge deal? I know they sap energy from the plant, but, you know, I know there's certainly... Uh, more harmful pests out there. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how you look at it. Thrips are often a vector for viruses in plants. Mm. The Tobama viruses come to mind, uh, like tobacco mosaic virus and things like this. Yeah, you can see them flying around there. Well, you know, especially with the, the soil and being out here, I mean, you, who wouldn't want a sterile garden, but it just does not seem to be in the cards. Yeah, I mean, thrips are one of those that are like on all kinds of plants, um, especially the, I mean, a lot of thrips are not this way, but the ones that we deal with are the big generalists like western flower thrips and chili mm. thrips and things like this. There's probably more greenhouse thrips I've seen on uh, cannabis in particular, but they're larger, they're black. The smaller ones that get everywhere that the thrip screen is for, mm. that's, for that's for western flower thrips and that kind of thing. So one of the other things that I see a lot of on these plants are these little white flies and you can see these things i mean they're tiny but anytime you shake the plants i see them flying around um i know our treatment options are limited this far into flower but uh what should i be doing different next round well you already mentioned the screen that can be helpful white okay. fly are very very small and it's also not known all of the different species that might get into cannabis but um, I think some of the generalists like your greenhouse white fly or your silver leaf white fly, which is kind of what these look like here, um, they're a little bit smaller. Uh, if you have a lot of like hibiscus and other kinds of like mm. common ornamental flowers, there's a lot of white fly that can be on there, like the rugos or the spiraling white fly. Yeah, with that kind of uh, webbing under the leaf. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The sort of like cottony yeah, threads. Yeah. So um, some of those are maybe a little bit into cannabis potentially or they might be around your plants and it's important to know whether they're going to be on your plants or not on your plants and so some research may need to happen for that uh, to have an exhaustive list but in general I would say that keeping them out of the greenhouse is of course superior um, there are organisms you can put on certain biocontrols Bouveria works really well against them in fact I cut my teeth on using Bouveria like more than 15 years ago on whitefly super okay. effective not having a dense canopy can be really helpful, um, airing it out. They really like to get up into really dense foliage. I have a lot of experience with white fly being used in um, hydroponic sort of floriculture where we had Gerbera daisies and things and the leaves would get very dense and you'd have to really like open up the canopy to really see and you'd see yeah. a ton of them and lots of wax. Yeah, I'd like to, I know there's mixed feelings on defoliating, but that's one of the reasons that I usually go pretty heavy on defoliating and probably a little late, too late for this season, but I did add this big drum fan. So, you know, it's, um, I guess adding some of these things, hopefully I can cut down this population next year a bit. Yeah, uh, another good one is cucumeris or Swirsky mites. Those will feed on things like thrips, and they'll also feed on things like russet mites, broad mites. Mm. In my experience, they also do really well at keeping um, a potential establishment very low or not non existent with the white fly. They come in, they're a small population. Those mites come in, they eat all their eggs, eat all the larvae, and the adults basically get washed out. Yeah, we talked about that before. They they have a, a a rather specific temperature range that they prefer, and it gets hot in this greenhouse. I think um, when I was putting these beds up, it was about 115 degrees plus. How much was the humidity? Um, it was humid. I don't remember uh, the reading on that day, but I think um, uh, it was probably around 65 percent. Yeah, the thing about these mites is that if it's dry heat, then it can desiccate them really easily. But okay. if there is a good amount of humidity, it can uh, allow them, especially with the microclimates of the plant, to survive a little bit better. Okay. So I would consider that. Yeah, and this side usually gets a bit more shade since it's up against the fence. And yeah, with these beds just kind of on this drip line all day, there is a bit of moisture here all day long. So I think I'm gonna give that a shot next time around. Yeah, happy to help. It's always great to have you here at the garden. Got a lot of things going on here. It's always good to have your insight. 
I appreciate it. It's a great example of some of the things that can happen in a greenhouse. Well, make sure to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you on the next video.